Hey everybody, welcome back to our neck of the woods and another video on the 1LE. We've got some unboxing of our first kind of performance parts for the car and also some protection stuff. And then I think in this video what we're gonna do is go to the dyno for the first time since we've got the car roughly broken in. We're gonna see what it puts down stock, we're gonna add some parts on, and we're gonna go from there and see what it does and then see what else we can do in this video on it. All right, so first up, it's been a couple days since we got back from the track, so we still have the 1550 racing oil in it. So I would like to drain that out because GM says they only want that oil in there for about four hours max of track time. Although I guess technically you could also put another two hours or so on the street on it and then swap it out. But it just sucks that I want to drive it on the street, but it's got the race oil. But if I drain the waste oil and throw it away, it just sucks that it literally only has like an hour and 20 minutes on it and probably like 100 miles. That oil is nowhere near used up yet. I mean, there's race engines that obviously do 24 hours of Le Mans and the oil doesn't get changed. And uh, that's 24 hours worth, probably practice too. And we literally barely only have an hour on it. So I'm debating whether or not I should drain it into a brand new container get another container, uh, like a bucket or something, seal it up 100% airtight, and then that way I can kind of put it back in for another race day. Uh, because again, the oil is so clean and new, it's just gonna depend on how I drain it and what it looks like. For example, if I drain it and I start seeing still some tiny metallic flakes because the engine is still basically new, uh, if I see that, then I'm not gonna put that back in. Uh, but it, it's just a thought uh, if I want to save it or not because it's expensive oil and it's nowhere near its life cycle But I don't want to drive the 1550 on the street when the 0 W40 uh, Is thinner it performs a little better on the street. It's got better sludge Activating properties and it's just a better oil than what the red line actually is because there are certain tests that the mobile one went through That the red line did not and the mobile one is guaranteed for long-term use anti-sludge, anti-wear, all that type of stuff that the red line just doesn't have that high of certification. But uh, again, it just depends on what you want to do. That, that's just my thought process real quick on that oil. But interestingly enough, if you guys remember in the last video for the track day, I went ahead and pulled fluid out of this. And as you can see, somehow it gained fluid back and now it's basically more full than it was. So the max marker is this line right here and it's already overfilled of that. And after driving on the track a couple times and I got back into the pits, it completely swelled up and filled that all up again. So I may have to pull out a few more CCs just so we have some expansion for that fluid to go uh, because it was not a hot day at that track day. It was only like 61 degrees max. And if I race this thing at like 90 degrees days, um, that fluid's gotta go somewhere. So we may have to pull a little bit more out of that. One of the first things that I got was the regular Camaro, I think SS brake cooling shields. Now again, are these shields needed or are the shields that they put on this car good enough? As you can see, these are just way bigger than what the factory ones are. In fact, here's a picture of the factory 1LE, the upgraded SS and the actual Cadillac uh, CTSV Blackwing. You can see that all three of them are different in size, shape, and everything else. And it's just interesting to see if, if we are having brake issues or cooling issues, that if we need a little bit bigger of a piece to grab more air and channel it into the rotor and keep them cooler. So they were a whopping $28, so I figured why the heck not just try them out and uh, we can simply install them real quick with those three bolts and uh, swap them out. And if we need the extra performance, if there is extra performance there to gain, then we have them. And next up, we got our first real performance mod. We got the Rotofab cold air intake. Now, is the, is the cold air intake needed? Uh, designs of intakes, along with exhaust systems nowadays, are pretty much probably good enough but by opening up this top air box here where the factory filter is, we're just gonna get a lot more supercharged sound that we can hear. So inside of the cabin, it's gonna sound awesome. 
Uh, Rotofab does, however, claim on their regular cold air intake that it can add as much as like 26 horsepower. And basically, we're gonna prove that. We're gonna take this thing to the dyno. We're gonna dyno at factory. We're gonna slap that puppy on, do another three runs, and see if we actually gain. Maybe we'll do two runs, give me enough time to swap that in, do another two runs, and actually see what happens. But it'll be interesting to see, just a little test that I can do. Uh, yes, we already have the catback exhaust on, but I don't think the catback exhaust really adds any horsepower. In fact, it might even take it away. The fact that we're going from like two and a half or two and three quarter pipe up to three inches uh, with no tune and it's straight pipes pretty much. So we'll just have to see what that actually does. But it'll be interesting to see if the regular Rotofab on this car can actually make horsepower. And they do make another one. It's called the Big Gulp. Um, that one you actually need tuned for. This one will Will not void the warranty you do not need a tune for it and if we can sneak away with like 20 horsepower why the heck not it was used the guy sold it to me in great shape he was actually upgrading to the big gulp so he didn't want the little one anymore he wanted more power and again the fact that we can throw something on just to give a, a better cooler sound whether it adds horsepower or not i don't care but it'll be interesting to see just do another couple runs on a dyno and actually prove it if it's true or not and then the last thing that we're going to do in this video that i don't have yet is I went ahead and bought an upgraded tow hook. Uh, I actually don't mind the factory tow hook. The fact that it's black, it blends in, it doesn't look bad at all. But the tow hook that I'm getting basically has a red center on it, so it'll stick out a little bit more. We can either swap that one and put that one on the front, or we can take this one or the other one, and what we're gonna have to do is probably drill a hole in the rear bumper, and through the rear bumper core support, We'll probably have to pick a location somewhere, like let's say I drill a hole right here, wherever that core support is. We'll probably uh, have to weld on like an aluminum nut or figure out um, uh, if we could weld it directly on. I think that tow hook may be steel, so we would have to like weld on an aluminum nut and then thread it in, or if the one that we have coming that's aftermarket, if it's aluminum, we might be able to weld it like right to the core support. And that would just give an option to tow the car or pull the car if needed. If we got stuck in a sand trap or something that we had something to pull out. So it would be nice to have one in the rear and the front, but uh, we'll just have to see what the material is made of and what we can actually do. We've got that coming. And then also to give the car a little bit of the protection I was talking about, we got some little tiny mud flaps. Uh, I have not washed the car at all in 1500 miles, so I don't know if I've done any damage yet, but these little bitty tiny baby mud flaps that stick out just a little bit are to help protect all of this, which you can see these wheels are so wide. They kick up so much nasty stuff all over the side of just tar and everything else that you pick up on the road. And then the other one goes back in here which you can see just how disgusting this rear quarter looks. So we're basically just trying to protect the paint a little bit. Obviously the ceramic coat is gonna make washing and cleaning in the future a thousand times easier once that's applied, especially getting off like road tar and stuff. And then we'll talk about if we can get a hold of a clear bra person and actually get the whole front protected. So we're basically just trying to protect the side, protect the front, and those parts should be here in a few days and we'll get it all knocked out and decide how we're actually gonna put it on, uh, again, with the tow hook and everything. And then we can, when we can make an appointment for the dyno and stuff like that. So hang tight, it won't happen today, but I will see you guys back in a few when I get all the parts and we get all the info that we need. Hey everybody, welcome back. So tomorrow is dyno day. It took a while to find someone who is actually willing to do it. I cannot believe how many shops just say no. They don't even give you a price. They just say, no, we're not doing it. Uh, I understand they're, it's a dyno. They're using it to make money and tuning and stuff. But uh, to give me an hour of dyno time and to pay a shop hourly rate of whatever they want to charge, even if it's not the shop time of like, say, 150 an hour, just tell me to run three runs. You want two, three, four, five hundred bucks. Don't just say, no, we're not even going to do it. But finally, I was able to find somebody who was willing to do it. Um, it is going to be $150 for three runs, but I said, give me a little, give me two runs. Let me swap out the cold air intake and let me do two more runs and then give me a price based off of that. If I get it all done in one hour, the, it's going to be, it is what it is. But, uh, I just went through real quick and pretended to take all of this off. It should literally only take 10 minutes. 
You've got a clamp back there, clamp back there, take off the mass airflow, and the factory airbox just sits in rubber grommets, so just pull straight up. And then there's a quick connect over here for this air hose. The only thing is we have to use uh, this metal or this plastic adapter piece that goes in between this one and into the cold air intake. We have to take off a metal ring that they decided to clamp on from GM instead of use like a worm clamp or one of these clamps that's like a, uh, a pinch style. So that's gonna probably take a minute to get that off of there because I have to use that factory plastic piece to connect the two together because on the cold air intake, they just give you a rubber hose that you have to put that piece in and then use a worm clamp to clamp it down. But again, the install really shouldn't take more than 10 or 15 minutes to pop off and pop on. So we'll do that on the dyno tomorrow. We'll get the dyno numbers before and after and hopefully we don't heat soak the supercharger Hopefully it can cool down for a minute while we're installing the cold air and my other parts showed up So we got our little baby tiny mug flaps They literally only stick out just a hair to help with rocks install should be pretty easy and then unfortunately from ZL add-ons They were out of black powder coated chromoly steel uh, for the tow mount. So this guy is silver, which that's another reason why I said the factory one doesn't actually look that bad because it's black and it blends in. While the red obviously is gonna stand out, that sucks that now we have to deal with a certain color that we didn't want. But uh, we'll figure out if it's gonna go in the front or the rear. Because this is chromoly steel, uh, we can't weld it to the factory rear support, so we're gonna have to find another way to bolt either one of these down to the rear to get us to pull out. And uh, we'll figure that out later. But tonight, I've gotta change the oil, get the uh, 10W40 out, so we got to, or 10W, or 15W50. We've got to get that engine oil out of there because it's probably going to slow down horsepower numbers, actually, uh, just because it's a thicker weight, probably slowing things down. I don't know, that's just what I always thought. So we're going to go put some miles on the car, get it warmed up, swap out the oil, and then we'll clean up the car a little bit, put these add-ons on, and then uh, I will see you guys back tomorrow morning. All right, everybody, real quick on these front add-ons, extremely easy. You're just using a factory hole right here with a factory push connector. And then this slot right here is for kind of like this serrated, like sharp thing that goes into there and it'll pinch in between the plastic and it'll pinch on the body and won't let it pull off uh, because of how it's like sharp right there angling in. And then you put another one up top. There's double sided tape. It takes about two seconds to install and you're done. Just make sure, obviously, you clean this up real good first and then alcohol the crap out of it uh, all along this metal right here so that obviously the 3M tape will stick. And I can tell you right now from doing the other side already, the inside of this body is absolutely chewed up. It is nothing but pepper flaked all over this metal already. So I don't think it'll rust out, but uh, definitely should have had something from the factory. And then again, just make sure you're alcoholing. Cleaner off, grease, whatever, just to make that a real good tight bonded surface. All right, so if you put the push pin in first, it'll help guide you to where the 3M tape has to go. So you can kind of see up and around there so it's not exposed, obviously. But keep that in there when you're actually setting this in. So that way you're not far off on your alignment. And that's it, the tape is set, pin up top, pin in the middle, and that clip on the bottom, and now that thing's locked in, and should definitely protect now all of this metal where we saw all of the rock chips already. Oh, and I do have one of these kits that I'm gonna link down below to Amazon. Definitely needed, 
one of those factory push connectors didn't really go back in 100% seated. So this guy right here has all different types of plastic push connectors. So you've got the ones that obviously are removable. So once you put them in their hole and push the pin in, it locks in. But then you also have ones that if you're pretty much sure you're never gonna take it out again, you have these ones that are kind of serrated in the reverse direction. So once you put it through something, it pretty much locks in. And I actually used one of these on the front because that uh, opening style just wasn't making a tight fit. But once you jam that in there and those serrations lock into the carpet, it ain't pulling out and it's gonna hold really firm. So uh, this was only a couple bucks when I bought it, but definitely something that if you guys don't have and you're a car person, get it. And it also comes with the tool uh, that you can get in with like a fork and pry out the ones that are actually removable and it probably work for the serrations too But it comes with uh, the fork removal tool also. Oh, and I might as well show you these guys um, These are from ZL add-ons also. This is the deluxe package. So pretty thick plastic one side uh, obviously has kind of like a textured effect while the inside is very smooth. So I don't know if the textured effects really match anything on the car. The car pretty much has smooth matte black panels everywhere, but it's not horrible. And again, just standing here looking at the front of the car, it's not like they even really stick out that far that you can even tell they're obstructing anything. I mean, you've only got an inch or so down here and then it tapers up to absolutely nothing. So it's not really an eyesore to have those on. Again, it's really just to protect the car uh, from getting rock chips on the white paint and stuff. So the rear, instead of clipping on or using 3M or anything, it uses factory locations, nylon washers, and extended screws to go through three holes, and then that will lock onto the rear, and then we really don't have to worry about this one ever falling off because it's screwed on. But uh, those front ones should hold pretty much forever. That 3M tape's strong, and those reinforcement clips pinch it onto the body that you can't ever really pull it off. All right, so for the rear, the tire does have to come off. The three factory bolts uh, are a T probably 10 or T15 uh, torque head. And as you can see, we're really recessed back in here from where the carpet's pushed back from where the body is. So hence needing the probably half inch nylon washer to space the washer out. And then you obviously then need a longer bolt to go back in there. So just three bolts with a Torx head. And then we're reusing, uh, it looks like a Phillips head bolt. So knock these out real quick. And then this should only take a second to put in. And it is a T15 Torx head to remove these. All right, that'll do it. That one's added on. It should definitely help a little bit protect the plastic bumper here, which I'm not so worried about the plastic since that can't rust out, but hopefully it keeps this whole side of the car now a little bit more protected as that air has to hit this and kind of divert out a little bit. So we'll see what happens, how dirty it gets in here. All right, done and done. Decided to put the red tow hook on just cause. And again, these uh, flaps are so subtle. They look like they're factory. They don't even look like they're really there, but they 100% should help protect the car, protect our investments, and still look good while we're doing it. I just got done draining out the race oil. Uh, it has 108 miles on it, and it looks fine to me. Uh, I see absolutely nothing in it. There's no silver floaties or anything. Uh, I definitely went and obviously drove around for it a little bit, so it is super boiling hot. Uh, I got a brand new pan here, so I don't know. I'll probably save it for now and then just think what I'm gonna do with it because again, there's only 108 miles on it. It definitely doesn't have any silver flakes floating around, so it should be good for absolute days on end. Uh, track day wise at least for a couple more so I'll save it for now I don't know if I'll actually use it I'll probably get the majority of the people in here commenting saying no don't use it just go ahead and spend another hundred and fifty hundred and forty dollars on brand new oil when you go back to the track and uh, what well, you know don't do that but I'm gonna save it for now I want to see what's in the bottom of the green pan so I'm gonna dump it into this brand new bucket also with a lid so again we can seal it and protect it 
just in case. But uh, again, there's only like an hour and 20 on the uh, oil and it's only been like 108 miles. So I wanna see if there's any metal flakes that have, that have floated to the bottom though and are sticking to the bottom of the screen pan. If I see anything though, I'm calling it. But uh, I drained it very cleanly, nothing got into it. There's no dirt or anything. And again, everything that I'm using is brand new. So if I save this for a month, I don't see why I couldn't put it back in the motor, but uh, I'll decide later. But let's see at least what's in the bottom of the pan and see if we see any floaters. Well, I don't know if you guys are gonna see it, but there is some stuff in the oil. Uh, we've got a black flake right there. Uh, another big flake right there that you can see on camera. And there's a few more. So there is definitely some speckledness of something in there. I don't know if it's metal or not. I don't know what else it could be from. Uh, they're black. I would have to obviously have the uh, oil tested, but again, we still only have a 1500 mile uh, engine here. And the fact that we just put uh, 108 miles of racing on it, that tells me that that should be the last bit of break-in. Uh, it saw the absolute highest RPMs that it could. Uh, it was moving at the absolute fastest rotation that it ever could. So that's probably a good indication not to use the oil because the engine is still shedding some debris and we don't want to put debris back into the motor. Even though the oil filter should catch that, the only reason why I can think that it's in there is because it was sitting on the bottom of the oil pan and the pickup tube wasn't able to suck up that debris, send it out through the motor for the filter to actually catch. It kind of just sat down in the bottom of the oil pan, which means it probably came from a piston, piston ring, a one of the bearings rings or the cylinder sleeves it probably just sheared off from something but then flo floated down to the bottom of the oil pan and was too heavy to pick up so obviously we don't want to put that back into the motor even though it would go right back down into the oil pan so we'll go ahead and trash this oil uh, we've got some more oil and some five gallon buckets that we got to take because uh, you fill up oil fast when you've got 10 quarts at a time so but at least now we know that uh, we won't reuse it. So let's go ahead and put the regular street oil in. I've got to pump up the tires because they're way too low and it actually does affect the dyno a little bit horsepower wise to make sure that you actually have your tires up to complete uh, temperature. So we're gonna pump up the tires from what the, the cold track uh, pressure was. And uh, again, I will see you guys back bright and early tomorrow morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to dyno day. So we are on our way. Uh, right now to get it done, uh, Dino Day is usually an exciting one because you're going to go make gobs of horsepower. But today we're not making any, we're not tuning the car, so GM, don't freak out on me. Uh, we're only just seeing what the car can run and what a cold air intake system is actually going to add to the car. So uh, still should be exciting, still should be fun to actually see what this thing can put down and what it's actually got. I did want to mention we are going to a shop that uses a dyno jet. So if you guys aren't 100% familiar with every type of dyno, um, dyno jet in my opinion is the best dyno to use. It's an inertia dyno. Basically you're just putting the car on a roller, spinning up a big heavy drum and the fact that the computer knows that you're going from point A to point B over a certain amount of time, you're generating a horsepower number and a torque number and uh, to me it's the most accurate. The reason being, you can't mess with the system. The drum weighs X amount of weight and if you can move that weight, there's your horsepower number. Other types of dynos like a Mustang uses a load cell which is electronically controlled and the tuner can mess with that giving different numbers. The reason why Mustangs exist is because it can be 20 degrees outside with a foot of snow on the ground and you can use a Mustang to give certain type of uh, drag on the mo or on the dyno and you can simulate going up a hill, going down a hill. You can manipulate more real, real world conditions on a Mustang. 
and that's awesome. But the fact is, if you start messing with the system, you're gonna have different numbers uh, on those calculations based on how that uh, Mustang is being dragged and slowed down by like the load cell or uh, how it's electronically controlled. Basically, like putting a brake on the roller. And if that load cell is wearing out or something, then you're gonna get uh, different numbers than if it was brand new. With a drum that never loses weight, that's always going to be the same horsepower no matter what. Uh, there's also axle dynos that bolt right on. Well, that's gonna change your numbers because you just took your wheels and tires off. You could have a heavy set of wheels and tires on your car when you go to the drag strip or a super light uh, set of wheels and tires. If you're bolting the dyno directly to the axle hub, then you're gonna have a different number than if you're changing your wheels out. So I am just a fan of dyno jet. The only thing that you can do on a dyno jet is either show the horsepower calculation in an STD, an SAE, or an uncorrected. That's it. You can't mess with the system or screw it up. Your numbers are always going to be basically 100%. If you dyno in SAE in Florida and you dyno in Colorado, your numbers are gonna basically be the exact same. Now, if you change it to uncorrected, then obviously you're gonna see the difference of Florida's heat and humidity versus Colorado's elevation and whether you're doing it in the winter and summer, etc. So uncorrected will at least give you the horsepower for that day but if you use the SAE correction factor then across the board no matter where you are in the world you should have the same horsepower uh, since dyno jets calculation should basically be the same for everybody but one thing I will say is most people will dyno in STD mode or correction factor and unfortunately that is wrong your car was manufactured on a bench dyno and it was manufactured on a SAE platform or a correction. So if you're using STD, then you're cheating yourself. STD targets a different temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure. So, and they read like a, a cooler temperature. So it'll uncorrect a 100 degree day down to like a 60 degree day, let's say. And it's not that much, it's like 70 or something. But it'll correct for a cooler temperature, giving you more horsepower. But the industry standard believes every manufacturer has agreed SAE is the correct number, which will target like 77 degrees Fahrenheit, which obviously will lower your horsepower because it's hotter out, the air is not so dense. So if you guys are using a dyno jet, you see that STD number, ask your tuner to go into the computer and just click the switch over to SAE and give you your correct number. Uh, there's no point in cheating. The dyno's gonna prove it or the drag strip's gonna prove it. Your lap times are gonna prove it. So just use the correct one. So we just got the base runs pulled and uh, it's more than I thought. I was thinking a good 15% drivetrain loss, which would have been about 100 horsepower or less, so about 550. But I think we made like 555, 565, and then like 570 something. Now, one thing I do wanna say is we are using the SAE again. So that is the correct correction factor. The only thing we're not doing 100% correctly is the A10 automatic transmission is supposed to be done in seventh gear. That is the one to one ratio. So that way you're not having any drivetrain loss going through the transmission to where it's going through gear 
motors and then going out, the one-to-one -one will shoot it straight through the transmission. Unfortunately, seventh gear on the A10 is pushing almost 200 miles an hour, and they do not want to push the dyno that hard. So we'll actually be a little bit low on horsepower uh, since we're using sixth gear. So uh, someone said there's a percentage difference between sixth and seventh, so we might actually have to add, add a little bit. So the fact that we were able to put down 570 something in sixth gear that means you're only looking at probably like a 12 percent drivetrain loss or less so that's freaking awesome so it took us literally five minutes to swap the intake he's gonna run not pull it but do some runs so it learns the new uh air fuel increase and then we'll see if we can gain on that 570 but that is crazy that three runs had such a difference in uh like 10 horsepower each. I wondered if you just keep going and going when it was ever gonna actually max out. But uh, hang tight, we'll do a few pulls with the new intake and then we'll see what that puts down. And we've got problems. Uh, apparently I didn't read the directions and it says in the directions, do not unplug the mass airflow sensor. Just unscrew it and pull the whole thing out still connected to the electricity. Uh, we unplugged it, then removed it, plugged it back in to the uh, new intake, and then plugged the sensor back on. We're throwing a hard check engine light, and we can't get it to clear even by clearing the code. So we've got another computer coming, hand tool, that will just clear the code out, and we can also disconnect the battery. But uh, Rotofab said, yeah, don't unplug that because this can happen. But I don't know if we need a hard reset from Chevy dealership now or not. So don't unplug your mass airflow sensor. Okay, we fixed it. So. He was using his laptop with HP tuners, and that's pretty much what everyone uses to tune domestic cars is the HP tuner software on a laptop. But for some reason, it could not clear the code. So the other computer he grabbed was just a snap-on uh, scan tool and uh, plugged it right in, saw all the exact same codes, cleared them, and they instantly went away. So something with HB tuners must just need updated because he said the Snap-on was updated about four months ago. And this is actually car of 2022. It's actually car 22 of out of like 100 and something that were made for the year. So still relatively kind of a new car and all the electronics nowadays are just a lot more crazy. So if you wanna avoid this at home, if you don't have a scan tool to clear codes do not unplug the sensor guys so 585 if you saw the numbers there for the final and that run number three was uh 572 so picked up 13 horsepower again it's weird to not see the horsepower drop down usually that doesn't happen on cars because usually run number one uh the engine's kind of getting used to the dyno run number two may be your highest and then run number three the car's so hot you actually start to lose horsepower so it's weird that we uh, stopped after run three and had that 572 when possibly run four and five maybe you could sneak away with a little bit more but as for the cold air intake we did do three runs uh 585 i don't think was actually run number three i think it actually might have been run number two uh in fact it was yeah that's how it should have gone 
but anyway that, that was just that's just different so 13 horsepower uh, for a couple hundred bucks and uh, the dyno did go over a half hour because we were trying to fix that scan so an hour and a half total is what I ended up paying for dyno time which added a couple bucks but uh, now we're gonna take it on the street we're gonna see if we can hear a little bit more whine bit it may not be that loud because the exhaust is so loud if we had a factory exhaust you definitely would hear more uh, supercharged wine but that is cool so again a couple hundred bucks we get some sound and I also am waiting on a quote now for the fabricator to get back to me we are going to go ahead and make a set of test pipes for the secondary catalytic converters and what we're going to do is because the MBRP uses slip fit and you're looking at slips uh, almost two to three inches in slip that's just going to be impossible to remove over time especially with water condensation that pipe will start to rust weld itself to each other and it's just going to be impossible to move because we are using mild steel pipe here uh, we're going to basically cut out the secondary cats put on flanges so the secondary cats can be removed test pipes can be installed for the racetrack and uh, we'll get some sound and again we don't have to worry about tuning or anything because the secondary cats don't do anything they're after all of the oxygen sensors so nothing's gonna happen and uh, it should just give us a little bit more sound and maybe we can figure out if we'll ever not drive this on the street and sell the cats for some money like we did when we went to Washington DC but uh, it, it, we'll just figure it out later so Hope you guys enjoy this video. I'm gonna go play on the street for a little bit and hear this wine and power a little bit more. 585 at the wheels. I'll have to do the calculation to see how much actually drivetrain loss we lost, but we should have gained a little bit more again if we could have used seventh gear. But unfortunately, we're not spinning a dyno up to almost 200 miles an hour. So 585 is actually a little bit low than what the true number is for the correction factor using SAE. So I am happy with 585. I was guessing 550 before I went. So I'm happy and I hope you guys are too and uh, enjoy this video. So wrapping it up here, I will see you guys later. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Comment down below if you got anything to say. So until then, see you next time.